Hi, everyone. I'm Gold Derby News and Features Editor Ray Richmond, and I'm welcoming Lauren Neustadter, executive producer of the Amazon Prime Video limited series Daisy Jones and the Six to our PGA Awards Meet the Nominees panel. Lauren, you've spoken before about how competitive the bidding war was to win the rights to produce the Taylor Jenkins Reid novel on which the series is based. Half of Hollywood seemed to be after it. Is that What was that process like? It's true, lots of people wanted it. Uh, all credit goes to my husband, actually, Scott Neustadter, who read the book and fell madly in love with it and really declared not only that he wanted to adapt it, but that he wanted to do it with Hello Sunshine. I had only been working with Reese for a couple of months. So he he bet on us, which we really appreciated. And, uh, and then we sort of went after it together. I remember he received it on a Friday. By the time we had dinner, he had finished it. He reads really fast and I read really slow. Uh, so I stayed up well into the night reading. And I remember that it was over July 4th weekend. I remember emailing Reese and saying, I know you're on vacation, but I need you to take your iPad to the beach. And she took her iPad to the beach and she was three hours ahead of me. So by the time I woke up, she was halfway through the book and we were just like, we have to do this. And so you know, I there was there was a lot of competition, but I think we had a lot of passion, and we were so lucky that Taylor ultimately chose to go with us, and we had the opportunity to to tell this story. And Reese, of course, being Reese Witherspoon, your production partner, was so this was not a tough sell. She took it to the beach, she read it, she was on board. I mean, I feel like for anybody who has read the book, it's it's love at first read. I mean, we really really loved it. And I think for a company that is all about putting women at the center of the story and showing them as heroes of their own stories in unconventional ways, Daisy Jones was really the perfect hero for us. And uh, and I also think a lot of the other producers that were in conversation with Taylor imagined it as a movie. And Scott very, very clearly saw it as a series and felt like he did not want to have to truncate the story that Taylor so beautifully told in her novel, but he really wanted to expand it and and tell it episodically so that we could know every single one of the characters and every member of the band and really fall in love with them. So that was our goal from the very beginning. So Scott immediately saw this as what, six, eight, 13. as many as 10 episodes. Hey, it was 13 episodes. When we presented it to Amazon, he had it laid out as 13 episodes. We wound up condensing it to 11 and then COVID happened. We were meant to start shooting in April of 2020. So we shut down in March and then all credit to Amazon, they really kept us alive. We would have been a very easy show to say goodbye to at the height of COVID. We were sex, drugs, and rock and roll. It was everything that was hard to produce, and they really didn't give up on us. And what they did say is these COVID expenses are going to be tremendous, so we need to bring it down to 10 episodes. And so we worked really hard to not sacrifice story, but figure out how do we fit it inside of 10 episodes, and then we started filming the show and also the band really had the benefit during COVID of being able to learn how to play and how to sing. And they really became musicians and they became a band. The bonding among them was incredible. And I think it really shows on screen. It, I was going to say, uh, Warren, that ended up being a little bit of a blessing in disguise, right? I mean, giving your actors time to turn into real musicians. It's a strange thing to say that that for this show, COVID was an unexpected blessing. Um, but I think it really was. I, I mean, these actors needed the time to learn how to really play every song and for Riley and Sam to sing every note so beautifully. And I think the show feels authentic because it really was authentic. By the time that we came back together and with our in intense COVID protocols went into band camp, they were a band. They knew how to play every song and they were playing it live. And we actually wound up, before we started shooting, I said to them, I said, I know that I'm not gonna win a popularity contest for this, but I think you have to perform live. I think you have to feel it. And so we had 40 people, which was the max capacity in the room. We tested everybody three times before they came in. Everyone was socially distant. They were wearing masks, but the band performed for all of our heads of department and everybody, all of the big wigs at Amazon, they got a show from Daisy Jones and the Six. And it was really pretty incredible. I feel like it was beyond my wildest dreams, to be honest. And then you end up putting out an album. I mean, I, you know, I don't just, admit this to just anyone, Warren, but I'm old enough just barely to remember when the monkeys became a phenomenon from 1966 <laughs> to 68. In fact, 
I was part of a little kid test era. audience. I was part of a little kid test audience for the show in early 66. You know, the so first nice. fictitious band, of course, to become a real one. Uh, and Daisy Jones and the Six, for all intents and purposes, was a real band. They put out the album Aurora. You must have been pitching yourself. I mean, beyond they, we got nominated for a Grammy. Like this was, they were the the top of the Billboard Emerging Artists list. I just the email that we would send among producers and cast, just saying, guys, we did it. You're a real band. Like this was, I will say, as producing goes, this this was the highest degree of difficulty. Um, but it was also just the biggest dream come true. And I feel like it's one of those things where we say that we all became a band in making it, but it's really true that if every single person hadn't shown up and really given 110%, the show wouldn't have been what it was. And I think, you know, it's really evident that everybody took it very seriously and cared so much. Um, and it, it was just hard. It was hard at the Emmys to say goodbye. How did you pull off, uh, Laura, all these, these, these massive concert sequences and make a project i mean you know about sex drugs and rock and roll at the height of a pandemic i can't even imagine i mean with everybody's distancing and wearing masks and you can't tell any of that from watching watching the series well it was really a team effort i mean our production designer jessica kender our emmy winning wardrobe designer denise wingate and our incredible post team that was led by mandy price really worked incredibly closely together. So for example, Soldier Field, we actually shot that in New Orleans and we waited until the sun went down and we shot from when the sun went down until the sun came up. And we shot it at a place called Tag Gormley Stadium, which actually is a place where I went to high school in New Orleans and that's where we would have high school track meets. So we turned that into Soldier Field and it was really a combination of this incredible build that Jess imagined and she actually sourced vintage lighting, like every single detail was authentic. And Denise did this unbelievable job with the wardrobe and we, I remember, I mean, I was there every single night, all night, but I remember that we had the max number of extras that we could have. And we would actually sort of have them stand in a section and we would tile, you know, section by section by section. And our music supervisor, Frankie Pine, who's so incredible and worked so hard with the band, would sit there and hype the extras and get everybody dancing. And then we actually in post realized that we needed more people. So Mandy, our post supervisor, brought the post team and a whole bunch of extras into the parking lot at where we were where we were doing post and we actually filmed more and used that for additional tiling i mean it was really it was a real undertaking but kind of a massive achievement i feel so proud of of what we accomplished and i will say going in we had no idea how ambitious it really was it was only when we were in it that we were like oh wow this is really hard but we've got to figure it out and i just feel really proud of the team that we did it together I mean, it was really sort of Daisy Jones and the sick because everyone around you had COVID. Um, Daisy Jones and the sick. By the way, there was a, when we, so we built the Soldier Field Stadium uh, or, or the stage and we got there and one of our actors tested positive. So mm -hmm. we actually had to take the whole set down and get another date because they had a track meet coming into Tag Wormley Stadium. So we had to push the whole thing and and build it again. I mean, this was a really resilient cast and crew. And I think we were going through what everybody was going through, but I think the scope and the scale of what we were endeavoring to do um, was really, you know, it was it was pretty incredible. And I feel like, you know, what a, what a cool thing that we got to do this. How lucky are we? What are the challenges, uh, Warren, in working so closely with your husband? Uh, uh, do you need to make firm rules to, you know, separate work from family time? Was there a lot of not now, honey, on the set? It's so interesting. I think that it was probably the easiest part. He and I are really, um, I think a pretty good pair and we complement each other really well. I could never, ever, ever sit in front of a computer and imagine a world and hear the voices of characters in the way that he does. And I think that through my relationship with him and my admiration of what he does, I, I just, I feel so much respect and reverence for writers. Um, and I feel so lucky that I get to do this job. Um, I don't mind having hard conversations. And I find that uh, most writers that I encounter would prefer not to have the hard conversations. So I kind of find myself 
uh, in the position of of sort of you know running toward the fire and I I don't mind doing it and I feel very privileged that I get to do it so I think we were a good team it was it was really a pleasure we're excited to try to find another thing we can do together and you get to work with Reese Witherspoon as your production partner how would you uh, characterize that relationship well, I mean, we joke that Scott is my husband and Reese is my wife. Um, I, I have the best work wife in the biz. I mean, we're really, um, I think we're a very good pair. We're both really hardworking and really passionate about the work that we do. I think that we're both really good communicators. And I think I feel lucky to work for her for so many reasons. But one of them is I think she hires people who are really good at their jobs and then she lets them do their jobs. Um, she is, when when you hear the phrase empowered women empower women, um, I can't tell you how many mugs and t-shirts and plaques I've gotten for Reese that say that phrase because I do think um, she is an empowered woman who empowers all of the women around her. And I think it's not easy to stand for so much, um, but I greatly respect the fact that she does and that every single day she wakes up and thinks about how she can you know, advance the roles of women in this industry and how she can be part of telling stories that center on women and reflect women's stories in ways that audiences haven't yet seen. Fantastic. I think we're going to wrap it there, Lauren. Good Thank luck to you so at the, the upcoming PGA Awards. Uh, Daisy Jones and the Six is currently streaming its 10 episodes over Prime Video. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Hi, everyone. I'm Bo Derby, News and Features Editor Ray Richmond, and I'm welcoming Todd Schulman, executive producer of the Amazon Freebie comedy series Jury Duty, to our PGA Awards Meet the Nominees panel. Todd, what a wild and unforeseen journey this Jury Duty experience has been for you guys. I mean, in your wildest dreams, could you imagine this little experiment in stealth comedy? You're getting four Emmy nominations, Golden Globe Critics' Choice PGA nominations competing against Barry and Ted Lasso and the bear, you must pinch yourself every day. I, I say to people, I say, we now have a taste of what Ronald went through of like, this doesn't feel like reality because I don't think any of us, I thought, I think we all thought it was a win. We got to make this show. Um, so the idea it's had this level of success and getting nominated for awards just is, as you say, very surreal. Did you suffer any sweet voice nights before you premiered? I mean, fearing that this could all go completely sideways and be the end of your career if things didn't work out with Ronald. I mean, I would imagine that you all had to be on pins and needles with this. Yeah, I mean, so I, I've worked in this kind of genre before, but never where all your eggs were in this this kind of basket with with one person for what ended up being 17 days. And so, yeah, there was a lot of anxiety for everyone involved. Um, but we had projected so much confidence to Amazon that I felt like we just had to pretend like we 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 believed in it and knew it would definitely work even when we didn't. Um, but yeah, it, it's certainly I mean, the 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 stress of it is the excitement of it. And I think all of that translates on screen when you're watching the show, you're kind of watching on two levels, right, where you can enjoy both. Ideally, it has like a narrative comedy, you know, that you've seen a million times before, but you're also enjoying it, knowing the live wire tension of at any moment, this could have gone wrong. We wouldn't be watching this TV show. And I think that really amplifies uh, your enjoyment in watching the show. But certainly when you're making it, it amplifies your anxiety. Yeah, that really is the whole idea of it. The whole idea of it is is the drama of, well, that, I mean, we imagine since we're watching it that it didn't all go sideways, but even so. Um, there's real drama inside the comedy. But, but if it were possible, I mean, to kind of step outside and become a casual observer, Todd, what do you think it was about the show that made it become this viral sensation? Man, I wish I knew so I could, we could do it many more yeah, times. you want to bottle but, it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think, I mean, look, I think so much of the credit has to be about Ronald. Um, you know, I, I think he ended up being just the ideal person to make this kind of show with because he is truly a lovely human being. And I think people watching the show, I mean, we knew or we thought we were going to make something that was funny and interesting and we were aiming for heart, but I think the level of kind of emotional connection we achieved really so much of that goes to Ronald and the fact that 
people just fell in love with him. And, and that was not something where we cut it in a way to make him seem like this, this wonderful human being. Like he really exuded that at every moment, the opportunity presented itself. So um, yeah, I, I think that is kind of, it's, it's Ronald and then TikTok algorithms are really what we have to thank. So you're sitting there just like rooting, please do the right thing, Ronald, please do the right thing, Ronald. As he's doing this, in, instead of, you know, being a horrible human being and you're like, oh God, because we don't want this to look like, this isn't supposed to be an indictment of a person. It's supposed to be something that actually lifts people. And if you hadn't had a guy like that, I mean, he thinks he's joining a, show, a, a documentary about the jury system, right? He has exactly. no ideas in the middle of a sitcom. Exactly, yeah. I mean, that was the, the whole concept of the show was, um, you know, I I had worked with Sasha Baron Cohen for a long time and, you know, he's a genius and the godfather of all of this in many ways. And, um, but like a lot of what, what we were doing there was kind of rightfully exposing like bad people and their terrible viewpoints, you know, like that, not always, but that was often what, what we were trying to do. And so part of the uh, idea of, of making this show was like, could we use some of the same techniques, but to highlight like a wonderful human being. And so, but that required someone to actually be a wonderful human being. Um, and uh, luckily, despite, you know, sometimes the world feels like it's, it's, it's in short supply of that. Uh, Ronald, Ronald was one of them. And then, of course, the ultimate climax, Ronald signs an overall deal with Amazon, Amazon MGM Studios to yes. produce, develop, and star in projects. Clearly, you didn't crush the man's spirit. No, look, I, I've i now <laughs> had the opportunity, been very lucky to go to the Emmys and the Golden Globes with Ronald. And I always tell people, he's the most comfortable person in the room. He's like, you know, because I think for him, this is all, you know, he, he, he showed up for jury duty and now he's at like these award ceremonies like... And so, yeah, no, he's living his best life. And I think, um, you know, uh, very, very happy with how everything turned out. So it, at what point did you suspect something kind of magical was happening? Was it was it when you found out, I guess, a hundred or several hundred million people were watching clips of it on TikTok? Yeah, we were all, you know, on a big text chain and we'd be like, oh, wow, look at this video. This has, you know, it, I, and it started off really small. I'd be like, wow, 100,000 people watched our trailer. This is amazing. You know, like, I can't believe it, you know. And then, you know, a few weeks in, it was all of a sudden like, wait a second, like this TikTok video has like 17 million views. Like, what is going on here? And then, you know, you would start to hear about, I would hear from my parents' friends who would tell me that their grandchildren told them they had to watch this show. And like, you started to realize it was kind of traveling generationally upwards that like TikTok was discovering it and being like, this is something my parents would like. And so um, once that starts happening, because, you know, we live in such a fragmented culture when you make something, you're hoping it just finds one small fragment. Like that's enough sometimes, you know, but the idea that we made something and that started to travel through these various ecosystems and connected with like a lot of different people was really, once again, beyond our wildest dreams. Because, you know, you're on Amazon Freeview. They, they don't necessarily even have an identity yet. So you're just hoping that someone watches you. You're, you're not- uh, When we, you're, when you're we sold it, it was IMDb TV. So, you know, that, that was, and- that was, It was originally IMDb TV. That's exactly. Right. And so we, Amazon Freebie, be, that name was like mid-production for us is, is when we discovered that's what we would be airing on. And by the way, so much credit to Lauren Anderson and Christelle Miller and everyone at, at Freebie because, you know, uh, it's kind of the opposite of, of Daisy Jones and the Six in a way where we pitched this all over town and people thought it was interesting but it wasn't like a bidding war. It wasn't that. And Lauren Anderson heard the pitch and media was like, I will make this show. And, um, you know, we were just excited that someone said yes, and we were going to get to make a show. Um, but we certainly had no expectation of, of what was going to transpire. How, how key, uh, uh, Todd, was James Marsden's going all in, giving the performance of his life as this entitled Hollywood jerk? That, that made it was such a difference in watching it, made it so much more entertaining. Sure. Once again, I mean, you can't underestimate also like, you know, we we had this role we had not yet filled of the hero, which ended up being Ronald, who we've talked about. But then when we were pitching the show, we also had this role of a celebrity. We didn't have James Marsden yet. And it was always kind of like, 
I knew we could find a real person like that's easy enough, but it was like, can we find an actual celebrity who's going to be, you know, you're not going back to your trailer after every take, you know, you're sitting in a jury room sometimes for six hours and the camera's never on you. You're just sitting there having to read a script, you know, or do, you know, basic action, eat lunch. And, you know, there are not a lot of people who, uh, who would be down for that, especially once again, now there's a kind of, proof of concept with jury duty you can say of course I would do that but at the time this was all uncharted territory and James to his immense credit we pitched it to him and his only concern was like I don't want this to be mean spirited he loved it but he wanted to make sure that the Ronald character would end up having a good experience and he went all in to his credit he you know he had no um, qualms about about satirizing himself satirizing the industry and and also just like being down to, you know, being part of an ensemble, you know, there's 12 people in that room. And, you know, James obviously has his storyline, but often it's not about him. And he's there for every second of it. He was incredible. And he had to be famous, but not too famous. He had to kind of thread the needle. You know, it couldn't be like Robert De Niro in the room. Yeah. Well, well, clearly something's going on here. Yeah. Um, I think James Marsden post jury duty now might be too famous. But yeah, I was going to say duty was perfect. Now you ruined it for him. Any any yeah. possible anonymity. Exactly. Um, and I'm sure you get asked this all the time, uh, Todd, but you know how much we love our sequels in this country. Uh, is the jury duty concept repeatable in any other area of life or discussions happening? You know, strike when the iron is sort of hot. Uh... Yeah, I mean, we certainly have like talked about and trying to figure out if, if it's possible, but no, nothing concrete or anything like that yet. We're not like, you know, full speed ahead on doing something, but certainly like we all loved the experience of making this. Um, and so if we could ever figure out a way to do it again, I, I think that would be exciting for all of us, but, but I, I have no, like, there's no formal thing going on or anything like that yet. Uh, I think we're going to wrap there. Todd, good luck to you at the upcoming PGA awards. Uh, Jury Duty is currently streaming its eight episodes over Prime Video. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Hi, everyone. I'm Gold Derby News and Features Editor Ray Richmond, and I'm welcoming Sarah Schechter, producer of the Amazon Studios film Red, White, and Royal Blue, to our PGA Awards Meet the Nominees panel. Sarah, your film is a queer rom-com, which I'm guessing even a decade ago wouldn't have been easily green to it. Uh, did it all surprise you that Amazon would step up like it did to so fully support this adaptation? I think one other queer love story as well, right? Yeah, yeah. This is the second queer love story we've made with Amazon. Uh, Jen Saki has been an incredible champion for us for as long as we've tried to tell these stories across television and film. I'm so so grateful to her. I think what was exciting, like this was sort of like uh, Lauren was talking about Daisy Jones. I was one of the people that didn't get Daisy Jones. So I'm happy for Lauren and for Scott. But um, there are these <laughs> books that they come out in this very early. They're not out yet. It's not that they're popular. Um, the, and, and Red, White, and Royal Blue was one of those books. And a lot of people were interested. Some people really admired it, but were scared of it. It was R, clearly R-rated. Um, and it was a book that we really loved. Um, my exec, Mike McGrath, was the first one who read it and kind of brought it to our attention. And we chased it hard. And Amazon really, from the minute we brought this to them, were in uh, with unequivocally. And I think the thing that they should really be... Um, truly like applauded for is that they don't they did not ever treat this film like it was a queer rom-com they treated it like a mainstream romantic comedy which it is you know and um luckily the book was a very big success and had a lot of fans and um but but even luckier for us the first some of the first fans were the folks at amazon and, and the book was not a big bestseller yet when you guys were no no for. no it was not published at all so um and then it became it, which was great. And then it felt like there was even more momentum to get the movie made, which was helpful. But we started the process just based on, uh, it's it's hard to find a romantic comedy where the obstacles feel legitimate, right? A lot of times it's sort of like, I'm going to, you know, I lost your phone number. It's like, well, now we have the internet you can find anybody, you know, it's like, so you have to find <laughs> real reasons why people can't be together. And um, and this felt like it had that kind of scale and that kind of um, drama to it. Yeah, it didn't feel contrived at all. Yeah. Um, how was it, uh, Sarah, working with a first time director in Matthew Lopez? I'm guessing he took direction well? Uh, sometimes, uh, depends on the day. <laughs> um, 
I, it's, it's something I've done a lot in my career and I always really enjoy it. Um, it's, it's really gratifying to kind of be that kind of lockstep with someone as they're, they're, finding Matthew is a very strong voice. He's a very successful playwright, but finding his voice as a filmmaker um, and helping to surround him with people that could help him with his vision. Um, but I've worked with a lot of first time filmmakers in my career and I, I always really enjoy it. It's really, um, it, it's very satisfying when it works. What was it about um, the book or the story that made Matthew want to be part of the adaptation? He was, was just he a fan of the book. He was a fan of the book um, with another writer, Ted, who was the first writer who who worked on it and delivered a really strong foundation. And and Matthew read the book and loved it and reached out. Um, my producing partner, Greg Berlanti, was involved in his play, The Inheritance. So uh, Matthew reached out to Greg to just say, I love this book. If it's ever something I could work on. And and then him becoming the the director was part of, was sort of a process as we worked on it, realizing he had a clear vision for it. I have a little side question that I've actually been wondering for a little while, Sarah. I was curious if you knew precisely why the term queer was adopted and reclaimed by the LGBTQ plus community when it was not all that long ago considered somewhat more derogatory. I think a lot of, I think part of the, look, I'm not the spokesperson for the, you know, the entirety of the queer community, but I think there is a history of taking back language um, and and disassembling it's 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 um the violence of it or the negativity of it and reclaiming it. Um, so I think there's a history of that in feminism. I think there's a history of that in a lot of different um, spaces. So I think it's also it's just more of an umbrella term, which I think was the you know you get yeah. a lot of letters in there and you want everyone to feel included. Absolutely. Are, are we coming closer? I know you mentioned uh, that this felt mainstream from Amazon's perspective to really mainstreaming queer love stories like this to the point where I they wouldn't so. be seen as an anomaly, even on broadcast I don't, TV. I don't think anyone in their lives experiences queer love stories as an anomaly. I think it is very rare for anyone to live their life and not know someone who is queer, uh, not have a child or a cousin or a brother or a parent. Um, I just think that it's, it, we talk about representation, the importance of representation. It's not about inventing representation it's about reflecting the world that we actually live in and i think that's what this film does and i think but it's not again it's just what's what's i think really sometimes when you make very commercial things people don't appreciate the politics behind them and the the savvy of them um but this is a really commercial piece that's meant to reach a lot of people so a lot of people can feel seen and seen see a reflection of themselves so i and that's why it's also like it's very it was very important to casey that um, Alex is bisexual. And, and that was an important part of our adaptation and really making sure that we represented that. But I think all these really specific experiences, if you're talking about the emotions underneath them, they're universal. And that's the power of cinema, right? And television is you connect to characters that are living different lives than you are, but are experiencing emotions you experience. I was gonna bring that up too about um, Alex being bisexual. Uh, rather than queer going in and, and that he's biracial. That had to drive certain segments of America fatty. <laughs> I, I don't know. I Again, I think um, a lot of people, I think despite what certain elections might suggest, I think there's a lot of progressiveness in America, especially like younger people. Just the fact we're having this conversation at all shows shows yeah. how progressive we no, are. I was, a, I was an executive at Warner Brothers for almost 10 years and like 15, 20 years ago, this movie never would have been made by a major studio. Oh, I think possibly even five years ago. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, you must have been thrilled that Uma Thurman was interested in playing the president of the United States yeah. here, and she's just okay. terrific. What a, what a clue. I'm, I'm just old enough to really appreciate all of what Uma means. Um, you know, I was a very big fan of her work with Tarantino, and so it was a pleasure, and working with her was great, and really connected and she really wanted to do a great job. And I think it's also really important that we applaud the people that contribute to movies like this, whether or not they actually uh, belong to these communities themselves. Cause I think that's what real allyship is. I mean, that's how I see it. Um, and so Uma being a part of this really helped give it, um, I mean, first of all, she's just a great actress and she, it's also, it's, you have to 
if you're casting a female president, which unfortunately still feels like a stretch in the current America that we live in and the amount of misogyny that still exists, you need a woman that feels powerful and strong where you're like, I would vote for her. And so when Uma Thurman walks in the room, you're like, I would definitely vote for her. I would vote for her just as Uma Thurman, not as the character yeah. in the film. No, absolutely. In, in the I would film. vote for her as Uma Thurman. I'd vote for her as the bride. I'd vote for her as a lot of different things. Um, you know, so much of the, uh, there's there's a lot of controversy and discussion, as you know, Sarah, about the idea of having, of being what you play, uh, you know, in terms of uh, minority, disability, et cetera. Should it matter to people what the sexual orientation I, of Taylor and Nekowis are in reality? Oh, I, I don't, I mean, I think they're actors and they're playing roles. Um, and I think that's their business. I think like authenticity is important, but I also think like you can't, it's actually not legal to ask people their sexuality when you're auditioning them. It's not appropriate. It's it's a personal, like it's not something that can be done. Obviously we want authenticity. I think when you're talking about like race and when you're talking about um, background and you're talking about uh, disability, I think that that's also really important. That's easier in a way to actually talk about to a certain extent. Um, but I think like Again, I just think like this, this is the full breadth of human experience. And I think um, it's, our, we're just excited that we had such great actors that wanted to be a part of this little merry band. I think, you know, there was a lot of speculation again about their sexual orientation over social media, but uh, something like this, I know it, again, it's nobody's business, but their own, but it, it probably also helped drive viewership to some degree too. I mean, just the- Well, I think what drove viewership was their chemistry. I think they've got great chemistry in the movie, you know, because they're wonderful actors. And Absolutely. They had amazing chemistry. Yeah. And I, I think Matthew also did a great job directing them. And he had a whole, you know, we really, we included a rehearsal process, which is, I think, so important. And so often due to scheduling and money and everything else, like it doesn't, you don't get to always do that. And I think it's, it's such a gift whenever you can. And it makes such a difference for the actors and for the audience ultimately. Did you see a lot of actors for both roles? To yeah, we saw uh, a lot of actors for both roles, and um, you know, I think it was uh, a real. It, they're great parts, so a lot of people were interested in playing them. But finding, you know, when you have a book as well, and I'm sure like Lauren also went through this, the audience knows a lot about the characters, right? Like the the because they've spent so much time with them and because like a novel allows you to really get inside of people so finding someone that fully like all the expectations that an audience brings it's not it's like an actor has to embody that and nick and both nick and and taylor were so good at like i mean they were carrying around the books they were really like they cared about the fans like they really wanted them to be happy uh with the rep with like how they played these characters i think they felt responsibility which is was amazing um, you might have noticed, uh, Sarah, for the first time, two actors who are openly queer, Coleman Domingo and Jodie Foster, were nominated for Oscars for portraying queer characters, which has never happened with two performers in the same year before. And th that has to be seen as progress to some degree. It's all progress. I think it's great. I, I mean, Jodie Foster should just win whatever award she wants, whenever she wants. And Coleman Domingo is amazing. And yeah, I think I think it's great. But again, I just think like we should keep making interesting stories. And the reason why they were nominated was because they're really good in good movies about interesting people, so. Absolutely. Uh, we're gonna wrap there. Uh, Sarah, good luck to you at the upcoming PGA Awards. Thank you. Uh, Red, White and Royal Blue is streaming over Prime Video. Thanks for joining us today. Of course, my pleasure. Thanks so much. Hi everyone, I'm Gold Derby News and Features Editor Ray Richmond, and I'm welcoming Tom Campbell executive producer of RuPaul's Drag Race to our PGA Awards Meet the Nominees panel. Tom, I'm gonna sound like a skipping CD here. That's the new broken record, but your show hey. just won three more Emmys in January, bringing the show's total to 29, I believe. Uh, you're going for your fifth PGA Award. What is it about this show that the TV Academy and the PGA so seem to adore? Uh, grateful for all those awards and your kind words. I mean, the three things that pop to my mind is there is a sense of joy with RuPaul's Drag Race. And I'll say selfishly as producers of it, and I've been there since the beginning, and Randy and Fenton, who run World of Wonder, have known RuPaul since the late 80s. And um, 
there we laugh every day. We have fun making the show. It's filled with joy, and I think that shows. Um, from a production point of view, we do try to outdo ourselves every year, and we try to make it fresh. And 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 there's a variety to our show that a lot of other shows have formats that are the same every week. And we're doing a match game parody. We're doing a musical. We're doing a fashion show. It all different changes. Um, but it really comes down to the queens, the contestants. We've been doing this show in my Facebook memories. Yeah, I'm still on Facebook. Uh, it said today, uh, it was my post to my, my, my you know, 10 followers, my Aunt Hazel, saying, don't you wish there was a, a show about drag queens like Project Runway and Top Model? Well, there is. It's Drag Race, and it premieres, you know, February 2nd on Logo and Logo Online. So it's been a long time. Um, and, and the queens, it's generations of queens now, and, and they come to us from the clubs, from the street, from different economic backgrounds and racial backgrounds, and they bring an authenticity and a, um, a, a a drive that is just, I think, irresistible. And oh my God, Tom, Logo, that was two networks ago for you guys. Uh, and uh, I'm on AOL, uh, excuse me, I'm on uh, Facebook as well. Uh, and I was on <laughs> AOL until not that long ago, so we're all old. Yeah. Um, the show itself, um, though, Tom, is actually symbolic, of, I think, of this indomitable spirit of drag queen competitors who appear on it. I mean, you've survived COVID, you've survived political demonization. Now here you are in season 16. What's the longevity secret for this show? Like I said, I think we're always trying to outdo ourselves. And what's nice with, and, and most people who come to the show and the senior members, they stay. And it reminds me, I worked at HBO a long time ago and I ended up moving, but my friend Carolyn Strauss and Chris, they all stayed. and. And I think there's something great about being able to like learn from your mistakes, to have like this a largely the same group of people and learning and changing and growing. And we are, you know, we think about the show 24 seven year round, everything because drag samples, pop culture, drag queens are the, are, are the best at that. We're all year long, we're uh, texting and talking about, you know, oh my God, this would be a great challenge or some crazy underwater or something would be a great mini challenge. So we're constantly, uh, uh, trying to improve it. But again, it really comes down to the queens and their stories. As much as we'd like to take credit for, you know, creating the canvas and the frame, the queens are the ones who bring their talent, their charisma, uniqueness, nerve, and talent, their 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 magic and their stories, which just are so heart heartwarming. I think my favorite part of the show, or uh, Tom, are the lip syncs and the backstories of the queens. I mean, the show is really this perfect blend of entertaining and inspiring. And I think that's a big, as you've already alluded to, a big part of the secret. Darren, who works at our show forever, and he's the head of talent, and he is now, you know, he's a, he's not as old as me, but he like is obsessed with TikTok. He's like he's like my teenage son, although he's not. And he says, "Drag Race is TikTok because it, you know, every two minutes something changes, a mood changes. It's it's incredibly dramatic. It's incredibly ridiculous. You can't believe you're seeing it. It's aesthetically beautiful. It blows you away. It's dirty. It's funny. It's funny. So." We just, uh, it's, 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 you know, we started off, like I said, in my Facebook thing, thinking it's, it's Project Runway meets Top Model, but it's become, you know, and it continues to, it, it becomes what the queens are and so much more. But, and, and you know, it's the perfect niche show, but it's not niche. It's mass appeal. It feels niche, but it's mass appeal. How did this become mass appeal? You know, I'm not mass, so I don't know, but like, it, it, it's funny, and I maybe I've told you this before, but. You know, when we pitched this 16 years ago, um, World of Wonder was hot. I, we knew people in charge. We were going to sell the show. RuPaul's back. RuPaul's the most charming pitch in a room, as you can imagine. And we went to all of the, I'm trying not to name them, but all the, the big players in, in cable television that were really big back then. And they took the pitch and they loved it. And they were our friends. And we even had shows on their networks. And they lean over and say, you know, we can't bring this to our ad sales guys. And when we finally set it up at Logo, at the time, and bear with me, it's like we were like, Logo? Like we're on Logo? And it turns out that it's the best place we could be. It was like an estuary. It was a place where we were the biggest show on the smallest network. And I also, you know, this is a history of people that know each other in Hollywood, but like um, um, Brian Graydon, who was the head of MTV for a long time and yielded a lot of power, he was able, you know, 15, 16, 20 years ago to convince cable operators, which are some of the most conservative human beings in the face of the earth, to carry a lesbian and gay logo 
uh, 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 cable channel in 50 or 60 percent of the country, which was not enough, but it, it cracked open the door. And 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 it, you know, Drag Race came out before streaming. It, it, streaming came, and they more people found out about it. Um, so it just it's like every good great underground thing from culture gay thing it's like a club you haven't heard of it's like voguing it's like things that drag race bubbled up it became sort of the secret that people found and i must say um, all of our celebrity guests and we've had some amazing ones including ariana grande this last season they're fans of the show they watch it you know i also credit the hair and makeup teams uh <laughs> who are largely queer uh in hollywood because i think they're they're always they turn on a lot of celebrities or had in the past to, to the magic of drag race brian Graydon, who gave the world south park and gave the world that spirit of christmas original holiday card too as i recall um uh you, you you just you just mentioned ariana grande um who that's famous besides that tom might surprise us to be fans of drag race oh my gosh i'm gonna blank it's it's uh uh we had Rick Fox, we had and John Sally, basketball players who were like really into it. Uh, um, and it's uh, it, it's everyone. I, I, there's someone who's on this year. I can't say because we, we filmed. Who's an old Hollywood name? Who is uh, and and she came on and she's a friend of Rue's and she, you know, we had Debbie Reynolds uh, on years and years ago and she broke into the control room no one else had and she goes, I'm Debbie Reynolds. I'm Princess Leia's mother. I'm Carrie Fisher's mother. She made herself known. You know, she's like four foot nothing. And she said, uh, is an executive producer going to tell me what to do? Or should I rely on my 60 years of experience in entertainment? And she, but we fell in love with her. And she's like, she was relating on the panel, like from an MGM star from the studio system, singing in the rain, Debbie Reynolds was relating to drag queens because wigs, makeup, lip sync. That's what she was doing, you know, for her career and her musicals. And she also talked about how her and her makeup man in the 50s would do, she would do Marlena Dietrich and he would be um, Rosemary Clooney in some crazy duet that exists in the world. So, you know, <laughs> drag is a is a, a long-standing tradition. <clears throat> well, but as you know, Tom, you know, we're living in this perilous time where, you know, where drag queens are now the most dangerous and threatening people on earth, uh, at least according to the Republican Party. I mean, no, anti-drag anti bills in Congress. What do you think, why do you think queens have become I mean, symbols of this moral decay to these people when in fact the opposite is really true. It's just the same old thing. And it, it's, it's. I wish we could say it's over. And, you know, when we started Drag Race, George Bush was in office. When they started to catch on, Obama was in office. And mar you know, marriage equality, you thought, oh my God, we're past this. And naive because the, the pendulum swings back and forth. Uh, interestingly, this past season that aired fully, um, when we shot it, there really wasn't this legislative, things happened so quickly. We shot it in the summer and and we came up with a musical called Wig Loose, which we just liked because it was a bad pun. It was Footloose, Wig Loose. And, we, and it was all about a town that it made drag illegal. And, and, and in the eight months between when we shot it and when it aired, this past season, those that that those threats and legal and and, and you know legislation for anti uh, drag and knocking down were real. So it's 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 a never ending battle. I don't want to be whiny about it, but it's just no. drag queens are bright and shiny objects, and they're easy to put down. But uh, it's bullshit. I know I would defy anyone actually to watch this show and not come away moved and raving right. about how loving and positive it is, rather than you know how drag queens are somehow coming for your children. Um, which I know you feel the same way. Absolutely. What's the best thing about working with RuPaul? Laughter. Making Ru RuPaul laugh is our job. Like we, we you know, we, we set up certain things and he's super, he's wise. He is a guru. And my personal opinion about it, because it's not, that is part of the show too. It's like, it's like, and I think why Ru wins so often is because he's not just mentoring. He's not just, you know, hosting, he's not just graphic copy, he's not just wearing amazing gowns, he's not just writing songs every season and dancing. He is like in the trenches with those queens. He knows what they've been through. And, you know, everybody say love. If you can't love somebody yourself, how are you gonna love somebody else? All these things have been part of Rue's vernacular. It's like Dolly Parton, he's been saying the same thing for 30 years because it still matters. And I also think in my humble opinion, spiritual people become spiritual because they're walking away from darkness you know they're, they're trying to, and I, I feel like 
not that Rue's a dark person, but I think he has his own demons, which he talks about. He talks about how every morning when he wakes up, his tail has grown back and he has to sort of like chop it back off again. So what the contestants are going through in, in you know, at 25 or whatever age they are, RuPaul has been through that and, and come out the other side. And yet we still have a daily, you know, a daily grind to like find our light and find our purpose and find community and strengthen each other. And that's what the show, it sounds crazy that that's what the show does, but it is about the tenacity of the human spirit, this little crazy drag show. Absolutely. Uh, we're going to wrap there, Tom. Good luck to you at the upcoming PGA Awards. Uh, RuPaul's Drag Race airs on MTV. Thanks for joining us today. My pleasure. Welcome to Gold Derby's Producers Guild of America Awards nominees panel. Today, I'm privileged to be joined by Lauren Neustadter from Daisy Jones and the Six, Todd Schulman from Jury Duty, Sarah Schechter from Red, White, and Royal Blue, and Tom Campbell from RuPaul's Drag Race. Thank you all for being here. Um, I wanted to start off by uh, asking each of you a question. I often get asked myself, uh, you know, I think most of us know what a writer does. We're also pretty sure we know what a director does. You know, they flip on a beret, grab a bullhorn and yell at people. Um, no, seriously, what exactly does a producer do? I, I realize there may be as many individual answers to that question as there are projects, but let's look at your own experience and start with you, Warren. I mean, I think what we do is we push every boulder up every hill and we are the people that everybody comes to when there's a problem. Uh, the analogy that I used, because I started off, Sarah and I both went from being studio executives at movie studios to being producers where we're working in film and television. And I feel like um, we probably have a lot of really shared experiences, but I always said when I was the movie studio executive, I would walk onto set and I would be like, I think I smell smoke. Is there, is everything cool? And it'll be like, everything's totally fine. We're good. You just sit over there and we'll come back and get you. And they would go and like put out the fire. Our job as producers is we just walk around. We've got the fire extinguisher kind of like casually behind our back and we're ready to put out every single fire. And we're the people that they go to when they smell smoke. And I think it's really our privilege to get to run toward it and, and figure out what's really going on and how we can make it better. Todd, uh, what was your job as producer on Jury View? I mean, I, I, I'm not going to beat Lauren's answer, but, uh, but no, whatever, whatever's needed, I think is really the simplest, you know, and, and certain projects have different needs than others. So on, on jury duty, which was truly like a very strange project and that there wasn't like one like singular author who kind of had this thing and, and saw it through from start to finish, it was kind of a collective. And so we were all constantly in communication and doing whatever we all had different skill sets. And I obviously coming from the Sasha Baron Cohen world, knew more about kind of how to meld the reality element to it. But then Lee Eisenberg and Gene Stupnitsky, who come from the world of The Office, obviously a lot of scripted experience there. And so I think, you know, as Lauren said, like, you know, we're doing whatever's needed and putting out whatever fires are presented on the day. And Sarah, how, how about you on uh, Red, yeah, White, and Royal Blue? It's funny. Well, just, yeah, I mean, I've produce a lot of things. And so it, it's always slightly different, which is maybe why it's hard for people to understand. But I think Lauren, the version I always say is like, when you're on set, you're just there in your full fireman gear, just waiting for a fire. So you're close. You know what I mean? It's like when there's a fireworks display and the fire trucks there, just in case, like that's a lot of what producing on set is. Um, but I think in general, look, producers are oftentimes the very first person to sign on to a project or the second or third. And we work on it for years and years and years. A lot of projects, we never make a dime because they never get made because producers, even though they're first, are oftentimes the last to get paid. And um, what we do is we have to build a dream that other people can can sign on to. We have to convince a lot. Of, it's a lot of convincing that like this idea or this writer's idea or this book or this actor's notion is enough and, and can have a foundation strong enough to make something from. So I think it's falling in love with something. It's trying to remember why you fell in love with it for years, draft after draft. And it's trying to make, you're, you're trying to assemble an incredible group of artists to share a collective story that will touch other people. And a lot of times, again, and then we're working on it till the very end. I mean, we're in color timing. We're in marketing meetings. Like I don't. I I think that producers kind of oversee everything and and um, work really really hard. Oftentimes without nearly enough credit. Um, 
But I think that a producer does everything is kind of the short version of what I just said. Including stopping ar arsonists from burning down the set. Yeah, oh, well, yeah, no, no, no. There's a lot of, ars there's a term called arsonist firemen and there's a lot of those in Hollywood that will set a fire just so they can be the hero that puts it out. But a lot of times they're not good at putting it out. They're just better at starting it. <laughs> Yikes. Uh, Tom, what's your day-to-day -day like? On I will just say Drag that it, it's, it is a, it takes a village people, we say on RuPaul's Drag Race. There are many producers and we shoot our shows in, most of our episodes are done in two days and they're total transformations. So we have story producers. We have, you know, uh, uh, the more of our technical crew producers. I do tend to do more of the talent creative producing. We all come together. There's our post producer, except we're all on, on everything, but we work together like a machine and it, it's, um, it's just a joy. And there's also a part of the production, I don't know if you guys agree with this, where it's like, you're always selling. Like, you know, oftentimes we're the ones who sell the show and then you're selling it back to the network. And when you have multiple seasons, you don't stop, you don't stop selling. You keep having to reinvent. And sometimes it's even trickier because you're taking a lot of this familiar elements, but finding a way to like freshen them and get people excited again and get campaigns going and get backing and all that. So um, we're here not to fuck it up, if I may quote a group. Did, did you start out there, top by saying it takes the village people? It no. takes the village people. That's a RuPaul quote that I use often. Thank you. <laughs> I, love I it. also think just to add to all of these great ideas, the other thing that we talk about a lot at Hello Sunshine is that producing is a lot like parenting, that you really like exactly as Sarah was saying, like so much we're, we're part of it in the very beginning and we never stop loving it, right? And you always see the show or the movie for its potential and it doesn't matter how hard it gets. You just love it more and more and more and believe in it more and more and more. And at the end, you get to, you know, sort of admire it, which I think it's kind of uh, as a mom, uh, as I as I look at my little tiny humans and I look at them growing up, it's it's all those things and all those feelings. But it's the never giving up. Much like parenting, it's the opposite of a nine to five job. That's right. 24 seven. Yes. Um, as I said, for years. Yeah. Um. For the next next question, I wanted you to talk about the career trajectory that led to your becoming producers, uh, because I'm not sure a lot of people set out necessarily to become precisely that, uh, even if they get into entertainment. Uh, let's go in reverse order and start with you, Tom. How did you become a producer? Me? Yes, Tom. I'm listening. I'm here. I'm here. I'm listening. Um, I didn't come through production. I came through um, uh, network. I worked at HBO, MTV, ABC Daytime and Development. And I was the network executive who got to come on and smell smoke and go, what was this? Um, and it was great. And I, I tended to work at places that were pretty hands-on. I was at MTV. I did scripted at MTV in 92, this a show called Dead at 21, which no one remembers. And um, and in daytime, I was always, I was, and I did all these different things, which is great, but I was so, I found daytime so remarkable because they make a show every day. Um, you know, so it's like, and if something's wrong, you got to fix that train while it's running. Um, and after, um, and I was at Warner Brothers in comedy and scripted, but after uh, I took a little break and after uh, 2000, when reality started, it just was kind of something for me that like, oh, I can, I'm sort of a lazy writer. <laughs> and so I have really good ideas and I can, I can sell stuff. And so it was um, um, through that and selling this show and other shows at World of Wonder that I've been able to sort of take that influence and ideas and, and keep them alive as a producer. So it came from sort of desk to, to set. Sarah, uh, how did you wind up in this crazy job? Um, I started off as a I started off as a PA on set uh, when I was in high school. I started working in production, which I would recommend for anyone to understand how it really happens. And then um, I at first thought I wanted to be a direct. I just was like very cognizant of how much I love the entertainment industry and how few women role models there were. So I was very cognizant of actually wanting to expand those ranks. And and um, so I worked for a producer for many years who I learned a lot from. And then I worked at Warner Brothers, which was really my graduate degree. And I worked with a lot of brilliant people and I got to make a lot of things. And that's how you get better as you, you know, you've learned all the great, like you, and I'm sure like in live stuff, it's the same, you, you face the same problems enough times. They stop being so, um, overwhelming you're just like oh I know how to do that you know it's like you're a car mechanic or something like so um 
there's uh so then I and then I partnered with Greg Berlanti, who was the greatest about 10 years ago and have been and he was sort of like, you know, you're a producer. I really cared way too much to be a studio executive. Like I really cared about the projects too much. People were like, why are you still in that script meeting? And I'd be like, why wouldn't I be in the script meeting? Like, what could be better than the working on the script? And they were like, ah. So I, I was really finding the right kind of Goldilocks job for myself um in the business. Okay, so what I got from that is studio executives don't care. No, I'm, I'm kidding. Sorry. No, they care very much, but they have to care about a hundred projects, and they have to actually they have to Absolutely. be a little bit more um, objective. I think, right? Of like, okay, well, the one that gets the movie star, we should really get behind. I mean, that's their job. It's it was my job, yeah. and you know, they care. They definitely care, but like, to you know, you you know. No, I was kidding. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> getting me in trouble. Um, sorry. How how about you, Todd? How did you, uh, how, how did producing come into your life? Sure. Uh, so I went to film school and then moved out to LA and was like, I'm going to be a writer director. That's my, that's my plan. And was out here for a few months writing and very quickly realized I hated myself. I hated what I wrote. I hated writing, but I told everyone that was what I was going to do. So I was like, I guess I'm just going to be a, a self-loathing writer, which is a very common occupation in LA. Um, but then someone reached out to Which me. Which is pretty much redundant too. Yeah, you're right. You're right. I don't even know why I said that. Um, but someone <laughs> reached out to me and had knew I was a huge fan of the Ali G show. And they, it was like the one person I knew in LA and they said, he's looking for an, he's bringing the show to America. He's looking for an assistant. You're not going to get the job, but you'll get to meet him. And I was like, please give me that chance. And I got the job somehow and was a terrible assistant. Um, but, but it was useful. It was a very small production. There was like six people on the road making this show basically. And so I got to do a little bit of everything. And so even though it was a bad assistant, I proved myself to be useful. And so continued to working, continued working with Sasha and he kept giving me, um, you know, increased opportunities to his credit. And before I knew it, I was producing his movies and the rest is history. That really is like going to school, being with Sasha Baron Cohen. I can't even imagine. It was, wow. yeah, yeah. I, and, you get paid in like cocktail stories is really the reality. I feel like the it, whole rest of the Zoom should be talking about the Ali G show and like working on that and just talking about, all, I mean, that what an amazing, I'm like, I love Jury Duty. You guys, I'm such fans of all of yours. Like, oh, thank, thank you. you. Yeah, no, it's, uh, yeah, it is like uh, a bottomless supply of good stories, but, uh, but, but also it's all that stuff, which I know we all have experienced where, in the moment, it's so deeply stressful. And then like you tell it the story three years later and it's hilarious, but in that moment, you're not laughing at all. So that's that's what it was for many years for me. I'll bet. <laughs> Lauren, uh, what led you to get into being a producer? I really wanted to be an actress as a kid. And then when I graduated college, uh, I came out here for college. And when I graduated, I realized that I should not be in front of a camera. I didn't quite know where I belonged. Uh, I went to work at CAA in the MP Lit department and then found my way to being an assistant at HBO Films where I uh, met my really formative mentor, Carrie Putnam. I worked for her. And when she went to run Miramax, uh, she made me an executive. I followed her there. I was I was there for a couple of years with her. I did a short producing stint and I felt like I was a better executive than a producer. So then I went back to being an executive. Um, I worked at 20th Century Fox on the movie side and uh, I oversaw a movie called This Means War starring Reese Witherspoon. And then I had a baby and I came back and I realized that the stories that I was most inspired by were being told on smaller screens. And so I actually made a jump and I went across the street on the Fox lot and I worked at the network. And I worked at the network for four years and change. I was in the process of renewing my deal when I got a call out of the blue saying that Reese was starting a new company and wanted to know if I was interested in running film and television. And my first question that I asked the mutual friend that called me is, does she know that I'm seven months pregnant? And the answer was yes. And I said, does she care? And the answer was no. And the rest is history. I signed my deal to work at Hello Sunshine when I was eight and a half months pregnant. I took a full maternity leave and I started when our daughter was three months old. And so now I'm going on almost, my daughter's birthday is next week. So going on seven years at Hello Sunshine. And, you know, I really didn't believe that I knew what it took to produce. Um, and I was really scared to do it. 
Um, but it has been the greatest joy and the greatest privilege. I just, you know, it is a 24 seven job. And I think it's a job that people can't do unless they care so much. But if you do care so much, um, how lucky to get to to do work that that we love. You know, what a privilege to be on the front lines. Absolutely. And the message there is get pregnant and you too can become a producer at a company. <laughs> no. Or, or, or be on the set as a studio executive and care so much that just like Greg saw how much Sarah <laughs> cared. I think I didn't realize that Reese noticed me, but um, she must have. And that was, Clearly. was back years later. Um, one last uh, quick question, uh, I think, before we wrap. Uh, I'd like to know if there's a television or streaming show each of you have seen in, say, the last few years that you love so much that you wish you were involved as a producer, but aren't. And the reasons why you wish so much you were involved. Let's start with you, Sarah. Oh, you can't start with me. I'm working scripted. That's not fair. Um, I will say <laughs> Daisy Jones. I really loved that book so much. And that was one um, that I really, like, I'm so happy that Lauren Scott and and Reese got to make it and do it so well. But that was that was a show. I, there's so many, that's what's great. There's so many shows I love. There's so, like, I love, like, Insecure. I was so sad when that ended. I love, like, I love Fargo. I love, there's just so much that um, inspires me. But obviously, if there was one show that I could have been involved in in the last five years, hands down, it would have to be Succession. I just, yeah. Like, we really are in, in something of a new golden age here. Yeah. There's there's so much there's so much choice and so much. But I'm so um, jealous of so many things, product. but that keeps us going. That keeps us inspired and excited. You know, Todd, how about you? What show have you seen lately or semi lately that you're jealous of? I mean, it's not that lately, but I, I just watched all of the rehearsal with my like jaw on the floor and was just like, this is incredible. This is what I love. You know. Um, so that would probably be my quick, simple answer. So good. How about you, Lauren? I mean, I feel like it's, it's fitting because we're on the Zoom, but I have to say jury duty. Like I thought wow. it was so innovative. And so it must have, every day must have been such an adrenaline rush and so overwhelming and terrifying and exciting and thrilling. And like just watching that last episode and seeing how you guys had to pivot um, I just can't imagine, I would have loved to have been a part of what you were doing to prepare. And then when you had to get that whole cast and like lie to him and figure out how are you going to move around and no one could break. I mean, just the degree of difficulty of what you guys pulled off. I watched the show as a fan, but as a producer, I will say, I just thought like, what an amazing, awesome thing you did and, and how cool must it have been to have been a part of it. I just thought it was really innovative and exciting. Well, I'd like to change my answer to Daisy Jones. For the record, <laughs> so just no, I appreciate that's very kind. You say I have to also give credit to like Nick Hatton and Cody Heller and Jake. It, like it was really a group effort, and those guys were on like the front lines. And yeah, it. But I really that's very kind of you to say. Thank you. I mean it. Finally, Tom. Um, uh, I'm going to give one you... controversial answer. I was going to say, who, friends, who can you praise in this room? No, um, I, I'm going to. I, my friends throw things at me when I say this. But I worked in music management. My first job out of here, I was not a big wig, but I saw everything. And I think The Idol on HBO tells what show business is more accurate. People are like, it's so uncomfortable. It's so disgusting. It's so, I'm like, yes, yes, that is the music <laughs> industry. Okay, that's my cynical, uh, cra crazy thing. And I'll I'll give it up to Jerry Duty. So you have to like RuPaul's Drag Race. Because no, I really do think it's so hard, because I'll keep it unscripted, because that's kind of what I do. But it's like, it's so hard to innovate. It's so hard to get someone to believe in that twist and 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 to invest in that and also to make something I I have no need to hear and I'm not putting anything down people love stuff but I don't need to hear housewives fighting I don't need to in my in my in my own head I don't need to see you know people backstabbing each other to try to get money I I, I need more love and buoyancy and I thought that that show really delivered intrigue but also had this incredible heart so good on you Thank you again. Yeah. Wow. We're going to have to. Yeah. I'm just mad at Sarah idol. now. Like, end what's the, the deal, idol. Sarah? Like, you like Succession better than Jury Duty? What's your problem? I can't let Dave Burnett's head get any bigger. Come on. T no T comment. Yeah. Todd's head is barely going to fit on the screen here now. Uh, we're going to actually have to wrap things there. I wish we could go on for hours. Uh, this is really fun. Uh, Lauren Neustadter, Todd Schulman, 
Sarah Schechter and Tom Campbell, congratulations on your PGA Award nominations. Best of luck at the ceremony on February 25th. And thanks for joining us today at Gold Derby. Thank you for Good luck, having everybody. Me. Nice to meet you. Nice Likewise, to meet you. Take care. Bye. Bye guys.